Hey, it works. <laughs> hey, well, thank you very much for uh, for that mercifully brief intro, John. <laughs> um, uh, and and um, uh, I would also just like to uh, thank everyone, obviously, for tuning in. And uh, and as you will soon uh, come to understand, I'm a bit of a fan of John's as well. Uh, fantastic new book on Joy Division, and you can imagine how useful uh, a book by John called 1966 was to a novelist writing a novel uh, which starts on the first day of January 1967. Thank you very much. Pleasure David. So well, the first thing I want to ask you before we get a bit lateral is just is just um, what inspired you to actually write this novel? Was it the period? Was it the story of a rock group? What was it? Starts what with was music the I think. Idea? Yeah, yeah. Sure. music. Um, this, this thing that is with us throughout the whole of our lives, if we're lucky, uh, and most of us are, and it is there for all of us, in, well, for most of us in one form or another. Um, it fascinates me, it's possibly the first art form we encounter, possibly even in utero, I can't remember, but it seems plausible. Yeah, uh, that, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, 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 and there's the rhythm, if you like, the bass track of our mother's heartbeats. Uh, then, at the kindergarten, and it's the Grand Old Duke of York goes marching up the hill. Uh, sorry, the Grand Old Duke of York had 10,000 men. These, these songs that are with us for the whole of our lives, obviously, like that one. Uh, the, then we get older, and uh, music can perform, it did for me at least, and I suspect your good self too. Uh, it provides a tribal identity. It helps you with this tricky question when you're that age. Who am I? What am I? You get older. Um, in music, you see future versions of yourself. You see versions of yourself that you prefer, and it gives you hope that you won't always be stuck in this shy, gawky, spotty, awkward, stammering, whatever your personal demons may be, body. Um, you get older still, jazz, classical music, uh, they do things to you, they, 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 they trigger endocrinological responses they make your heart go faster they make the hairs on the on the back of your neck rise um get even older and you find that songs from long ago become containers they become time capsules for the time and the place that you first heard them and encountered them and that day that afternoon cycling back from Woolworths with the lp over your handlebars in a plastic bag flapping awkwardly against your knee and the front a tire of your bicycle it's it, it's it's there it yeah. just takes me back uh this is a this is an incomplete list uh we might come back to it later but um what a relationship so music i wanted to write a novel just to consider what is it and how does it work yeah. uh, and then the time the the second part of your question uh, you wrote the book. You literally oh, wrote the well, book. Yeah, uh, you well. know what a great you know what a great year it was. You know what a great era it was. Um, the splitting of pop into rock, uh, the invention of the album, not as a box of tracks, but as an art form, as a narrative, as a journey in its own right, as pictures, as an exhibition that are hung just so for a reason. Um, three star bands started making four star, five star tracks at least occasionally albums um it's irresistible the music the drugs the uh, ground zero of soho um this transgressive liminal zone where things that are not normally possible are not only tolerated they're they're well they're encouraged they are um yeah. so uh it's an open goal and i couldn't resist I, like, I mean, I always remember doing some research in mass observation, and I found this letter to mass observation from an American jazz critic in about 1938, mm. who suggested that syncopation grew out of, um, and, and the, the use of syncopation, the way we're obsessed with it, came out of when you're in your mother's womb, there's your heartbeat and your mother's heartbeat. So you've actually got two rhythms going on against each other, which I just found completely fascinating. That is pretty gorgeous. Um, and the last music I, I really liked like that was I absolutely adored early jungle because in the early 90s, because there were two rhythms going opposite each other, which is the slow bass of reggae and the kind of hyperspeed breakbeats. And that was an example of that, really. I read that soon after I'd been into jungle, and so it must have been in the mid 90s. 
I'm a very late uh, discoverer of EDM. Um, and, and just sort of the breakthrough moment for it was when a very patient younger friend uh, explained that it's, it's, it's not primarily music for the mind, it's music for the body first. Uh, it gets to the mind via the body, but it's actually for the body. It's a, and, and, and when a DJ plays a great set uh, at an EDM club, what is happening is you are actually, so your cardiovascular systems are the raw material, are the artistic medium that the DJ is working through. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, when I heard that, then I understood. Uh, and, 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 and it's sort of, um, yeah, it's, it's added to the, uh, to the, uh, to my repertoire, to my Spotify repertoire. I, I suppose I suppose we are conditioned by when we first hear I, the first music. I really tu I really started to tune into music in 1962, just before the Beatles. And one of my favourite records was by somebody called Del Shannon. Yeah. And it was called um, Hey Little Girl, and it was complete melodrama. Um, it was just so melodramatic. It had a wonderful lyric. Well, you think you've got a paper heart when she starts to tear it apart. Uh, it's you know it's pretty pretty good, and, yeah. and I've always thought the pop music in particular, which is not necessarily the main topic of your book, because 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 Utopia Avenue a bit of a different band, but pop music is all about heightened and distilled emotion, and that's why it plugs into the parts of you that aren't necessarily rational you know, or every day. I mean, I love music because it's it's all about time and space and moving through different times and different spaces. And it enables you to live in different worlds, much like you know other forms of art do, like novels, for instance, um, and in uh, particular yours. You know this one. Um. Uh, thank you. Uh, this segues rather effortlessly into a cunning list uh, I have here uh, of questions I prepared just in case we didn't have anything to talk about. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, uh, a couple of nights ago, I asked. Um, I, I, I had a conversation with. David Byrne and and I sort of tried to throw him a curveball right at the end and and I asked him what is music for uh we'd been talking about lots of things but I was hoping to catch him out at the end and he gave a great answer uh he talked about uh connectivity uh it well, is exactly, yes it's a form of glue um yeah. form of glue between different parts of your mind between your mind and your body uh and then actually between different human beings uh, it's it, it's it's a cohesive force um i also suspect there are as many answers to this question as there are people you could ask it to so um, um i wonder if i could throw you the same not much of a curveball now because because um, <laughs> 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 no um i was going to the first thing i was going to say was that it brings people together and again Going back to my search, and this was for actually the, the book I did in 2017 age, and I found this wonderful letter from a swing fan in Germany to uh, Nazi Germany to a swing fan in New York, a pen pal, yeah. where he just says music is is to bring us together. It's not about any of our politics. It's to bring up, bring people together, not to divide them. And that's really what I think about it. And even the sort of petty bitching that people like me, who used to be a you know, music critic, um, has about bands and everything, it doesn't really matter because music, it's, it's, it's all part of that kind of same family. I also think that um, for me, music is the way I see the world. Um, I perceived the world through music before I did really through other forms of art. So it's absolutely central to my life. So I would say that music is life, um, as far as I'm concerned. And there's not all, you know, a lot of people aren't that interested in music. You know, they'll buy one album a year or down the stream now or download one album a year and be bloody Ed Sheeran or something. But, um, you know, if you are a music obsessive, then you've all automatically got a kind of brotherhood with other musical obsessives, and, and that's a strong mm. brotherhood, really, and can transcend national boundaries, um, which is very important at the moment. When, when I first went to Japan, there were, for, uh, there were still record shops, um, which shows you how long ago it was, uh, 1994, and 
Tower Records had a presence in Japan. They still might, actually. Uh, it was cool to have English slogans, but uh, no one in Japan back then really spoke much English, so the English slogans had to be really simple. Uh, and the slogan for Tower Records is very simply, no music, no life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll pretty, go with that. It's pretty much oh, what God, you just said. Tower Records, bloody hell. Oh no, somebody's just said from Michael, has uh, just uh, typed in to say Tower Records are still in Tokyo. Great. Um, they matter. Uh, like bookshops, they were more than just shops. Uh, they were pl uh, there were pl there were places you could go and um, hang out, hang out, meet your tribe. Um, I mean, and there was one. In, uh, there was one here in North Wales called Cobb Records in Bangor, and it really was a meeting place for the musical tribes of North Wales. Even and you noticed it even more than you would somewhere, you know, in London, like Rough Trade, because, and you know, the, I mean, the Rough Trade shops used to, are still like that, I think, but you really noticed it somewhere small because that was a place where lots of musicians and music fans met. And when it went, it just left a huge hole. Uh, in uh, your books, I just happened to have here, uh, <laughs> This Steering Light by Mr. John Savage. Uh, you quote uh, Bernard Sumner, who says the same thing about the record shops in Sulphur in Manchester uh, and there was one near him uh, and it shut for about three weeks every year when the owner uh, got on a ship went over to New York bought a load of stuff up came back with it and, uh, and, and, and that's how it worked in those days that was the only way you could get records from abroad um, was it 1966 as well did you just talk about the importance of the ports uh, of how um, it was actually the sailors who brought it in uh, and that's why it's one reason why Liverpool and the East End of London are relatively band rich because that was the interface between the outside world and uh, and and the UK because that's where the ships came in. Yes, I mean I love all that. I love I love all the um, you know it's 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 such a powerful story. Um, and I mean we could talk actually about you asked me a question. I, maybe you could rephrase it about real life narrative going in fits and bursts and stops and starts and how did i reconcile that with joy division um, <laughs> um, uh, no, no, uh, no rephrasing is necessary uh, i should explain to people um, that we both have the same cunning sheet of segued questions yeah, uh, we planned everybody okay um to be honest david i just plowed through it yeah. Um, the actual, it took us about 18 months to, to get the deal together um, and it took me, um, the basic assembly of the book took me a week because I had all the interviews transcribed and I knew what I was going to do and it was real, real, really fast. I like to write really, really fast. I can spend months prepping but when I write, I like to write really fast. Um, because then you get that immediacy, um, which is really important, I think. In a sense, then, as much as a writer on a book like this, you're, you are a compiler of interviews. Exactly. Uh, and, 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 and where I'll spend in Utopia Avenue cost... <laughs> it's really interesting that, um, uh, that the non-fiction approach... Or, or, it, it, it isn't an approach, but it, it, it took me about four years, uh, my book. Now, I made false starts. I was doing a few other things as well. But... Um, but there was no ploughing through it at any stage, really. It, it was um, because there wasn't anything to plough through. No, I sort of had to make, a, had to make all the plots, thing. make all the yeah. characters. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, um, do you feel that characters shape themselves? Do they take on their own lives? Do they suggest to you, uh, do they suggest to you what might happen to them? Uh, truth is yes. And I was hesitating because when writers do talk about well the characters just tell me what they want to do it, it, it's sort of a little part of me dies inside but i've never found a better way of saying it myself so uh, that's the dilemma i'm in um I'd, I'd maybe rephrase it by saying um i only get stuck and yeah. i always get stuck when i don't know the characters well enough yes uh, that's a good point and a good and uh one. so this is a slightly kind of less new agey way of saying the same thing. I think it's perhaps more a, a, a craft artisan um, way of saying it. Um, and so the answer then is to, um, to um, 
well, what I do is, I've said this before, but I write letters from the characters to myself in their voice. So I get to know more about their lives and their backstories, and I get to know more about their relationship with music. Uh, sorry, with language. It's interesting yeah. I said music instead of language. Um, I, I, I just want to hop back a moment, John. I don't quite want to let you get away with, I just planned through it. It is a coherent, cohesive, quite gripping story. Uh, Joy Divisions, I mean. And... Um, um, or, or more precisely, it is a gripping and compelling read. Uh, and as we know, films are mostly made in the editing suite, not yeah. in the studio, uh, yeah. not when the cameras are rolling. I'm wondering what your editing suite process looked like and what it looks like in general, because what I think you're, well, so this is part two of the question, is what you're about to say, which I've not yet given you a chance to say, but is, 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 is your answer for this, would it also be true for your cultural history work when you okay. sort of have to do the same, say in the case of 1966, not for a band, but for a year, over? Um, I always overwrite, uh, uh, because it just all pulls out. Um, you know, I've taken in all this info, I've processed it, lived with it for quite a long time. Um, in the case of Joy Division, I've been, you know, I knew, I've known them on and off and the people around them for 40 years. Um, not terribly well, but I've been in their orbit on and off for 40 years. Um, I knew Tony Wilson and Martin Hannett and Rob Gretton very well, but not so much so bad. Um, and um, I actually love the editing process um, because to me, that's when uh, the book becomes a book. Um, and to me, editing is actually an incredibly creative process, mm -hmm. as well as being a necessary protest, uh, process, not a protest. <laughs> and, um, whoops, and... <laughs> it could be both, also, it depends on the book. It's great where, it's great to have, I usually work with female editors, which I really enjoy, because you don't have the headbutting that you often get with, um, men and um to have somebody intelligent critique your work and help you to make it better is just an incredible privilege um, yeah, yeah and so i actually really enjoy the editing process even sometimes when it's savage when i was doing the teenage book i wrote a, i went down the rabbit hole and i wrote a whole chapter about the 1893 world's columbian exhibition in chicago <laughs> my american editor slash what is this shit over the whole chapter and she was right. Wow. I didn't need to go down that rabbit hole. I just you, got obsessed. Uh, were those her exact words? Or, 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 or have you slightly amplified? Wow. Hey. Pretty um, much. No, she, yeah. she's uh, Wendy Wall. She's tough. <laughs> and, but she's right. Um, and so, and with Joy Division, it was, I knew the story. Uh, I'd done a lot of the interviews in the book. So I knew the characters. The main thing was taking out, obviously, which I do any used to doing because I used to transcribe into, you know, do interviews with musicians, yeah. take out all the ears and the ums and you make them look good um, and you make them coherent. And then you try and get some of their voice, most of that, as much as you can, their voice coming through. And Bernard and Stephen and Peter Hook all have very, very different and distinctive voices. Yeah. And that was very important to me. And I wanted to make their voices and the voices of their other interviewees almost sound like poetry. Wow. Uh, I really wanted it. I really wanted their voices to sing. Did you read the, uh, the Bowie book by Dylan Jones? Yes, I enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, I mean, yeah me too. It, I it, mean, the oral history, it, it's, I was very inspired by that book. I don't think I've ever read it. It's fantastic. I really recommend it. By um, Gene Stein called Edie about Edie Sedgwick. Oh, it's yeah. fantastic. It was the first really big oral history to, you know, to become a literary success. And then of course, which I know have interviewed you, in, in, influenced you, because I caught a bit of Levin, you know, the, the manager character Levin in it were the Andrew Lou Golden books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, they were a gift, uh, both the period detail, but also um, he and maybe Joe Boyd, who uh, managed Fairport Convention and, um, and early Pink Floyd, um, really, and, uh, and of course had the UFO Club on Tottenham Court Road, which is sort of ground zero for psychedelic London. 
I've before it moved down to the Roundhouse. Um, they were a very interesting breed of manager, uh, new school, who, who, who actually liked the same music that their, uh, their acts were playing and who, well, uh, of their... Uh, many sides to all stories regarding bands and uh, managers, but they, they didn't nakedly, um, and uh, they weren't into fleecing the band. Uh, no. that, uh, that wasn't what they were there for. And Levon didn't come alive, the manager. Well, the book, did, the book wasn't right, the band wasn't right until I got the manager right. Um, right, I really liked him as a character. Oh, thank you. Uh, largely thanks to Andrew Lou Goldham and Joe Boyd's books. Um, that was, uh, in an earlier draft, he was a sort of Arthur Daly opera, um, operator. Yeah. But, but, uh, which, of course, until the mid-60s, they, they all were, pretty much without exception. Uh, they came from... Uh, they, were the, they were the descendants of musical booking agents. Um, and... And... They invented publicity. They invented what we're doing now. Uh, they uh, they invented the um, slightly unholy pact with sections of the media. Um, Andrew Lou Oldham specifically here, um, <laughs> in an era where the word a publicist didn't exist. Um, he was sort of doing it before the word existed. Really interesting man. Um, I um, I could talk about this lots more but I'm I'd like to sort of move on if I may um uh casually glancing down at my cunningly concealed <laughs> uh, list of questions uh you asked me about the era you asked me about the year yeah. um now when we were talking yesterday in preparation for this uh you mentioned a little bit about your new project uh yeah. which which uh which, and it's up to you how much you want to get into that but it focuses, if I'm allowed to say this, on, on, on a sort of sequence of stepping stones through, uh, well, from the uh, 50s to the, early se uh, to the late 70s. Yes, um, that's right. Um, a stepping stone is a year. You've got five stepping stones, five years. Uh, I'd like to ask, if I may, Mr. Savage, what is it with you and years? And how come one year uh, seems to speak to you uh, more temptingly than, in many cases, it's more obvious near neighbours, for example, not 1968, but 1966. It's also true, I sort of learned more about 1968 from your book called 1966 how, how than come, I did from... How come? Yeah. Um, how come me, or, or, or was that a, a, a rhetorical... Sorry, I mean, yeah, well, that, that's a very interesting statement. How, how did that happen? Was it, was um, it because of the split of between pop and rock and, and, and the new attitudes that were happening in the end of the year? Or was it uh, that? Uh, because you showed where 1968 was coming from, uh, yeah. you sowed the, you showed uh, the seed germinating and putting out the tendrils, uh, and 1968 was the flower uh, yeah. or the fruit or, or, or um, the strange fruit. Um, but you learn more about the strange fruit from from the seeds and yeah. uh, the germination right. process, uh, right. both in botany and cultural history. So why some years and not others, John? That's well, in a way, it's a kind of accident. Um, in a way, it's, it's um, we all get obsessed about things. I think if you're a writer, then, uh, like I said about going down rabbit holes earlier, you get into kind of strange obsessions. Um, the first big book I did was basically set in 1977, which was England Streaming, a book about punk and Sex Pistols. That was the mm. key year, really. But 76 important. It's, it's the doubles. The doubles obsessed me. So I did 77, then I did the teenage book, and the key year there was 44. And <laughs> then I did 66. So the first year I'm doing in the new book is 55. And it's bingo, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's, bingo. It's, it's double year bingo. Um, I suppose I'd have to do 88 or, 80, or 99 next. Um, 88 would be cool um, mm. because it's, 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 it's um, you know, the start of Rave, which I adored. Um, but um, yes, and it's, 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 I find that I sit and do a lot of reading, a lot of thinking, um, and then events start to cluster together 
and I certainly found this in 1955. I'm, I'm writing about, in a way, in, in the widest sense, the gay influence on pop and youth culture yeah, from in, in the post-war period. Um, basically because I do regard, which is another function of music really, which is that it brought to light all these people and all these voices who had been underdogs, who had been marginal, and it gave them power. And the perfect example of that is, is obviously Little Richard, who I've just been writing about, yeah. and also Elvis. Um, and um, the whole point about the chapter, it widens out from the slightly vexed and slightly tedious questions of exactly what people are. Are they gay? Are they bisexual? Are they, oh, who cares anyway? They're weird. They're different. Um, and when Elvis came out in 56, the American mass media basically said he's a prostitute he's a female stripper he's a burlesque dancer he's the lowest of the low and so that says something very interesting about masculinity and it's one of my things about pop culture and again the widest sense is that it's freedom sexual and gender freedom for everyone and that includes straight boys who don't want to be beer monsters and so it's this idea of expanding the idea of what masculinity could be and in a way, Elvis and Little Richard, you know, in the middle of uh, Cold War America, they prefigure the future. One of the things I really liked about the book is it's obviously in the psychedelic period, but it's properly psychedelic in that you get time travel and you get sort of transmutation, in, in particularly in, in Jasper's character. <coughs> I, um, He's a wait. guitarist in Utopia Avenue, by the way. Yeah. So Jasper, uh, Jasper's an interesting case. Uh, he, um, uh, he's the descendant of a character in one of my other books. Uh, yeah, all that. Yes. Uh, the Thousand Jacob. Autumns of, uh, if, if we're in the Netherlands, Jacob de Zoot, or, or, yeah. or, or, or in English speaking, Jacob de Zoot. Um, and really Jasper's a kind of a toggle switch or, 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 or um, or there's, or, or in his strand, there's a toggle switch that's sort of installed. Uh, if you have read Thousand Autumns of Jacob de Zoot, then what is happening to Jasper is something like um, uh, a sentient curse that has been passed down the bloodline for 200 years, uh, is slowly gaining more and more sentience up until the point when in a, a kind of one dramatic day in a backflash when... Uh, <laughs> I've been asked, please no spoilers, I'm only halfway through the novel. <gasps> okay. Uh, <laughs> then... <laughs> but it, but I, I just found that sequence, I found it absolutely, I found it absolutely gripping. And well, I think you. it's very difficult to write stuff that is psychedelic without being stupid. It's also actually very, very difficult to write a novel about the music industry and a pop group that works. And, 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 and yours definitely does. I mean, all the characters are very well... I like the fact, I know you've done this in other novels, each character has a sort of part of a chapter or a chapter. And so you follow the four through and what they're going through. Um, they're the songwriter of the chapter. So it, it, it's, it's uh, the drummer doesn't, uh, he's not so active uh, as a songwriter, but uh, Elf, Dean and Jasper, uh, they write songs and each of the chapters is a track. Uh, the album is sequenced according to, well, uh, the novel is three albums and the chapters are tracks on the three albums and the track is written by during the course of that chapter um, um, the point of view character uh, this is reminding me of uh, the joke on I'm sorry I haven't a clue when they're explaining the rules to sing one uh, song with the words of another and a part of the joke is that the explanation is needlessly complicated is, uh, uh, is, is far more complex than the game itself. Uh, if, if, uh, this is more straightforward than I'm making it sound but it does mean that um, you get inside the head of well hopefully convincingly uh, of, of songwriters which yes. is a fascinating process, which is a fascinating thing. Um, what is a song? This, this, this sort of sonic hand grenade of, of, of potential extraordinariness. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take that and slightly jump back um, to, to music as a zone for transgression. I was really interested in what you were saying about that. 
Um, and I remember, you may remember better because you've just been describing it, but um, the distrust and actually the fear that uh, people who were older than the age group that the music was for viewed um, viewed the makers of the music, um, oh, yeah. which was a trick, of course, that um, which was a fire onto which Andrew Lou Goldham uh, <laughs> famously yeah. uh, gleefully just um, poured hundreds of litres of paraffin and uh, petrol, um, but it's still with us. Um, this idea that music and musicians are dangerous, they can be a threat to established norms. Um, I wanted to, I mean, this, I'm not really talking about my book so much here, but, um, but uh, this is, it. It's hard to talk about your book as well without giving plus away, that's the problem. And, you know, and, 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 you know, I don't want to do that, um, you know, particularly some of the details. Um, I think that, um, well, when I was a child, uh, when I was 13 um, or 12, I, was, I loved the Stones and I wasn't allowed to watch them in my parents' house. I had to go around to my grandparents' house to watch them. I remember Karma Chameleon coming on. Oh yeah, that'll do it. Top of the pops. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was my version of the Stones. <laughs> uh, a very uh, different uh, view of masculinity, yet nonetheless an expansion of what was there before. Uh, so the theory still holds, I think. Um, it is fascinating. Um, it was a funny old program. Was Top of the Pops, wasn't it? Uh, there was so a, a sort of rarely has uh, Theodore Sturgeon's Maxim. Um, the American science fiction writer, 90% of everything is crap being truer than Top of the Pops. But the 10%, uh, maybe the less, uh, maybe it wasn't higher than 10, but some, sometimes something would come along and we're still remembering it now. We're still talking about it now. Uh, and I, I, I just remember uh, Karma Chameleon coming on and I hope my mum who may be watching won't mind me repeating this anecdote but I remember mum saying you know there's a lovely lovely pretty face under all of that makeup uh, she, 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 she just didn't get uh, understandably yeah, George. <laughs> that was the point uh, um, and where am I going with this I'm not altogether sure the Utopia but... Avenue do top of the pops I think also it's part of it's part of the 60s experience and maybe beyond everybody thinks the 60s which is where your book is set uh is like kind of austin powers everybody you know going down carnaby street in a union jack mini with you know greatest hits of the 60s on three cds blasting out yeah. but actually it was exactly that to sit through top of the pops in, in the 60s and during the time of your book was to wade through oceans of crap and then the 10% or even the one record that stood out was so much more powerful because of that. If it had been all great, it would have been harder. But if you put Utopia Avenue next to, which they would have been, next to Engelbert Humperdinck, who was ubiquitous in 67, then they would have stood out amazingly. So the darkness makes the flame shine more brightly. Very much so. And so to go back, so, so you've actually written some lyrics, haven't you? You wrote a lot of the lyrics in the, in the book. Yeah. And, then you had to, oh. and then you had to write some. I think you're just transcribing from the very, from the very hard to find Utopia Avenue LPs, David. Oh, uh, well, if there's a man who might be able to find them, <laughs> uh, Mr. Savage, then I think you just, we, we could just all be looking at him now. Um, for a long time, I... My initial idea was to not go anywhere near the lyrics, not put them in, because what lyric could possibly possibly be as good as the one I hint into being in the reader's mind? Uh, those are matchless and perfect because they don't exist. And that, was, that would have been fine for a novella. Uh, that was working for 100 pages. So much of my first versions of the book did work really well for 100 pages and then drove off a cliff in their Union Jack Mini. And, um, then I realised it just be, it, it started to become rather farcical that uh, these characters who are talking about everything else in their working and personal lives we get to see everywhere. Why aren't there any words? A few songs are so great. Let's hear yeah. a few then. Huh? Um, and so I had to sort of grasp that nettle uh, without my marigold gloves and uh, and pull it. Uh, so 
and lyrics are hard uh, as, as, as any songwriter I know will generally attest. Um, uh, they, uh, they, maybe they're even harder when the song doesn't exist. Uh, yeah. And, and, and uh, they're not poetry. Uh, they regularly need to be poetic, uh, uh, poetry-like. Uh, they're not philosophy, but if they are completely devoid of ideas, then kind of what are they? Uh, they aren't characters, but then if, 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 if the song is exactly the same at the end as it was at the beginning, if there's no kind of a journey at all, then what's it been for? And it also seems to be true, even as I've been talking, of, of little counter examples of, um, of uh, antitheses of the thesis that I am spontaneously uh, uh, verbalizing also appear in my head. So it's hard to imagine any of the lyrics to Donna Summer's I Feel Love than those lyrics, but but actually it's ooh, I feel love, I feel love, I feel love, I feel love. That's kind of it, I think. There's could nothing else I, in this. It could have been I feel lunch, David. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so there are these elusive, tricky to capture. Actually, actually, and they work with music. They do what they are supposed to work with music. That's the whole point. Yes, yes, they do. Um, and they often happen when somebody's presented with music. You know, if you're working with, with if you're working, you know, if you're working by yourself, solo musician, then you work out the the, the music with the words, don't you? At the same time. I would imagine so. Um, or with the collaborator, one yeah. works on the music, the other one works on the lyrics, and then yeah. you've got that dialogue going. So it's hard doing it yourself. Uh, and when um and when the music is imaginary as well, uh, even more than perhaps. Um, but it does a, mean that you won't be sharing the royalties. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, spoken like a true, and I think I'll stop there. <laughs> no, 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 because one of the one of the Michelle has actually said, David, will you be sharing the royalties with your bandmates or grasping onto the lot like most songwriters? <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, I'll be sharing them with all the with all the band members uh, who, of course, <laughs> happen to be me. Um, uh, well, uh, I guess we'll be finding out. Um, there's about two. Th mm, there's about maybe five, six songs that are either partly or, or substantially quoted in the uh, in in the book. But then the pandemic hit, and uh, no no more book tours, no festival appearances. Yeah. Uh, the usual shop windows for people like me to sell something yeah. like the book I've written, uh, are shuttered. So um, there were some interesting early meetings uh, when, when, when the truth was dawning. What can we do? And uh, there were sly sideways glances at the music industry. Uh, extra content was the word, which it might be one of those marketing terms that make your eyeballs roll back. But actually, yeah. kind of why not at a time like this? Just try it and see what happens. And if it's enjoyable maybe creative work anyway, why not? So I then um, um, wrote all of the lyrics to all of the songs on the first album and became a little more <laughs> systematic there. And I discovered, um, uh, I, d I discovered the value of theft uh, and how I would take an existing song that I like that was maybe something that was maybe had an unusual signature or, or an unusual structure that I would erase the lyrics, the pre-existing. Yeah. Oh lyrics. yeah, very good. Yeah. And I would kind of transpose my own onto it. Uh, in doing so and in making that fit, it somewhat altered uh, the um, the the song anyway. But uh, have you got then, any, have you got any examples of those? Any, any examples of those? Songs? Well, uh, for for people in North America who pre-ordered the book, uh, yeah. they get the <laughs> they get a special code that they can. Uh, uh, they can download the songs from anyway, but uh, I, 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 um, I was um, accused by someone on Twitter earlier this week, playfully, I, um, I hope, of, of um, time zone based prejudice uh, and uh, how people in, um, in a different territory uh, get certain things at certain times, including uh, access to these the conversations. Uh, am I ready to share them? Uh, I won't quite go there yet, but the internet being the, the internet, they're probably swimming around in, in, in the ocean already. And what I've tracks, been, what actual existing tracks did you do that with? Can you give me one example anyway of, of, a, of a song that you took, 
kept the music and got rid of the lyrics to make one uh, I can, uh, and it's pretty obscure that most people won't know, but you will. Uh, Reconsider Me by Warren Zevon. Oh, very good. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a Stevie Nicks version, which is even more obscure than the Warren Zevon version. Um, but I don't think I'm going to win this competition of the most obscure track against yourself. It's, so. it's, not, it's not a competition. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Not a, uh, we did agree. Uh, uh, in fact, it got quite competitive uh, about how uh, uncompetitive we, uh, in fact, are. Um, I've been monopolising conversation for a while yeah, here, John. I think maybe uh, you can pass the okay. conch shell over to you. Have you got... Um, I mean, there's, there's, uh, I like to ask writers and artists and writers what I call the compost heap question. What cultural artifacts found your way into your creative compost heap as a kid? Um, mm. And mm. for me, it was music, as we've discussed. I, I was brought up in the suburbs and that was the only thing that was real, was music. Just because you've said music, I'd like to dig elsewhere and see if I can get anything from you. Uh, Cartoon strips. Um, well, when uh, you're a pal, David, I mean, I love Popeye. Comic books. <laughs> You'd have two, sorry. I love Popeye. Popeye, okay. <laughs> um, uh, a bit of pop psychology here, but uh, did, were you a young man in need of the, of, of the occasional spinach hit? Um, I don't know, really. I think I was, you know, I was so unsophisticated. This is being... I'm 15 years old than you, so the media was in a much more primitive form. Um, and I, I think it would have been going to see exhibitions. I remember going to see a, an Aubrey Beardsley exhibition in 1966, and that blew my mind. Um, so, you know, it would, be, it would be things like that. I'm going to see a Magritte exhibition shortly afterwards at the Tate. Um, and uh, reading, you know, when I was a teenager, reading things like Gorman Gast, which was a cult novel at the time, which is a wonderful book. Yeah, wonderful yeah. illustrations, very archetypal. Yeah. And actually, I suppose that's one of the things, that, and I do want to bring it back to the book, because we haven't got much longer. I love the way that in the book, Utopia Avenue are a kind of, are a kind of zelig. They actually do meet John Lennon. They do meet David Bowie. Um, and I really enjoyed that. And I wondered whether that was something that you'd also wanted to do as a way of you meeting these people and having an interaction with them. For sure. Uh, in, the, in the final version of the book, uh, it's the Zelig factor is rather toned down compared to how it was. I think uh, <laughs> uh, that's one of the places where I needed my, um, my, uh, my Hawkeye editor's help maybe more than anywhere else. Um, uh it, it yes it well it was irresistible um it would have been strange if those cameos weren't around uh because it was a relatively small scene they did the most, yeah they all went to the same club go to each other's parties they go to they went to the same clubs they uh they drank in the same bars where the session musicians uh who could do things that they couldn't do or who could go and play the cornet at a moment's notice uh, on a track that needed a cornet um, would hang out. Um, so, of course, they slept with each other. Uh, they, they played on each other's records. So uh, one reason I did it was, was, was mimesis. It's kind of how the world was. Um, and, um, of course, they, uh, they bring... Well, there must be a word in German for, but I can't think of it in English. I'll go with the compound reality concreteness. Yes. Uh, they bring that into the book. Uh, and, um, and they can be ideas containers. Um, they weren't all thoughtful, deep, cerebral people. Um, they weren't all embodiments of particular ideas. Some of that came retrospectively. Yet it's also true that some of them were. Uh, so, I like the encounter. I'm going to give one away. I like the encounter with David, or a couple of encounters with David Bowie. That was great. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I'm glad you say so. It was an interesting year for him. He had his first Very. album out, '67. It, uh, um, yeah. Um, uh, have, have, have you seen that recent documentary, uh, yes, Finding Fame? Wasn't yeah. it? Wasn't it? Terrific. Um, 
I had no idea how much failure his success was founded upon. Uh, he had about six, seven years of never really getting anywhere. Um, with with the brief hit of a uh, space oddity, but um, but 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 there was a substantial downwards dip, and until uh, until he hit upon the trick of not being himself, of yeah. uh, playing, of of pretending to be who he wasn't, kind of with Ziggy Stardust. Um, so so he was a great um, he was a good angle of incidents for fame and ambition um one thing that really sunk in oh one thing that stayed with me from dylan jones's book was he had told somebody uh, i think a girlfriend who he took back to his parents house one time it, it was it was just this phrase and i'm not quite sure if i've adjusted it a little bit retrospectively but the phrase i remember was i can't live like this i just can't live like this i can't have this life in a house like this I, I I cannot do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, uh, I nicked that for Dean, uh, for my bassist. Yeah. Who, he who also just play. I mean, the, the characters that really stood out for me were, were Dean and uh, and, uh, and Dean in a way is the strongest cat. In in a way, for me, was the strongest character. Um, although of course the others are, but but and and but particularly Elf as well. But that he was very strong character. Uh, I was only smiling because I'm really pleased how different people have different strongest characters. Yeah. And uh, that, um, that, um, that I think is as it should be, or, or I think any novelist would be pleased to hear that. Well, also he's the, he, in a way for reasons that we will not divulge, he is the central character in some way. Uh, in some ways, his, uh, <laughs> his, 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 his arc maybe has, uh, it is most firework like. Yes. Is that sufficiently cryptic? It is sufficiently cryptic. I think that we should turn it over to the Q&A because we've now done five minutes over our allotted time. So right, I'm so we sure have. we can continue to uh, extrapolate. But um, here's uh, one from Tim. Uh, David, what was the most interesting record slash artist you discovered while, whilst writing Utopia Avenue? That's a good one. It is a good one. Um, many I already knew, but that is, of course, not the point of the question. I'm going to slightly, um, I'm going to slightly cheat and go for songs rather than artists, uh, because if an artist was consistently interesting, it's likely that I would have heard of them. Mm. Uh, but um, um, uh, um, you'll have to help me. Um, oh yeah. Marion Faithful. Uh, she did a thing called Train Song, which oh, is. Oh no, Vashti. Vashti Bunyan. Ah, Vashti Bunyan. I'm sorry, sorry, Vashti sorry. Bunyan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Vashti I'm so glad right. you're in that chair and not anyone else. Otherwise, uh, uh, the Twitter storm would have been. Lethal. What a song! Yeah. Uh, it's beautiful, and she, 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 she sort of her, that stage of her career when indeed she was a protege of, Ang, of Andrew Lloyd um, yeah. uh, of uh, Andrew Lou Goldham. Um, that's an overlooked time it, it sort of got erased afterwards but 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 it shouldn't be uh there's a couple there's a few gems from that period and that's one yeah. um, she did um she did a wonderful version of a rolling stone song called something's to stick in your mind and there's actually footage of it on youtube it's just sensational really worth watching uh well thank you for the lead um <laughs> i'll have another I'll, I'll have one more if i may which was um uh Ask Me No Questions uh, by, is that Bridget St. John? Um, that I don't know. No. Um, uh, I could Spotify this. Uh, she was a discovery of John Peel, who had already got his perfume garden radio program uh, up and running by then. So um, that's how I discovered the song through John Peel's book. Um, there are many on, uh, on a playlist called Utopia Avenue 2 and Utopia Avenue 3 which was pretty much crowdsourced by people via Twitter. Who, um, cool. uh, I, um, um, uh, you have out, uh, you will be able to out obscure pretty much everything, I think, John. But, oh, um, okay. but, but um, nice, to, nice to hear their, it's going to be nice to hear what they think about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. 
I mean, I'm always interested in what other people think. I know what I think, so <laughs> it's just yeah, yeah. Um, you're a bit bored with yourself sometimes. <laughs> uh, the playlist that's just called Utopia Avenue uh, is is the one I made. Uh, uh, based on people who appear in the book, songs that appear in the book, oh, uh, musicians whose awesome. shoulders uh, rub shoulders with my characters in the book. However, the ones, uh, it's exactly what you just said, it's Utopia Avenue 2 and 3 that I'm interested in because I didn't know any of the songs beforehand or not many. And what are they on? Are they on Spotify? Yes, yes, they All are. All right, okay. Uh, Spotify, everyone. I'm going to go on as soon as we finish this and have a look. Uh, the higher the number, the rarer they get. So Utopia Avenue 3 is where the real, uh, th really things I've never heard of before exist. Thank you for your question, Tim. If there's any more for any more. Oh yeah, there's plenty. Katie has just said, Bridget St. John, ask me no questions is right and very good. So there you Thank go. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, la 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 la. Um, from, Im from Iman Kabi. Um, sorry, I haven't pronounced it well. Uh, could we know what musician would David be? A drummer, a bassist? Yeah, I'd go for bass. Um, it's it's it, it's it's the unsung thing. Uh, uh, the lead guitarist gets obviously the crown. Sometimes the vocalist. Sometimes the lead guitarist is the vocalist. Uh, but. Drummers have particular brains, and all I know about drumming is that I don't have the drumming brain. Um, Mick Fleetwood is pretty good on drummers' brains in his book. Um, there may be, uh, it, it, uh, um, yeah, um, it, uh, I've read lots of books in highly varying uh, of, of of highly varying quality, uh, and sometimes uh, that's true within. The same book as well, yeah. um, but Mick Fleetwood's got a really good. He, he's 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 really good on. Um, uh, actually, the, uh, the 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 neuro atypicality uh, of drummers. Uh, a surprising number are dyslexic. Um, oh. um, he, he's he's really good. On, but it's the bass. Uh, the bass oh. is is it's somehow the authorial hand of the band. It's maybe yeah. closest to being a novelist perhaps um it's 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 the subtext you only notice it when it goes wrong or when they're so good that there's a kick-ass bass solo so uh so that would be mine how about you john i'd be i'd be the drummer so we could form a rhythm section great okay, <laughs> okay. And i'm not dyslexic but i'm just fascinated i often sit and listen to drumming on records um it's yeah. just one of those weird things okay this is from lisa you mentioned that Jasper is a, a descendant of Jacob. Your characters often appear in your different books. Is this planned in advance or do you weave previous char characters in as you write a new book? That's a nice question. Uh, it's both. Uh, I always knew that this guitarist needed to be uh, Jacob. I was, I've never stopped being curious about Jacob. I've never stopped being curious about um, I've never really, I don't really stop being curious about any of anything I've done. It's just some fade and others don't. Yes. Uh, so that was there way from the beginning. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and I just imagined this, um, I've always been interested in Sid Barrett, uh, that, that there's, there's something charismatic and magnetic about, um, his icon as well as the man himself for yeah. that brief time um, so uh, just combine those two uh, things that do not fade was quite irresistible for me uh, and then it's also true that uh, I'm writing something a vacancy for a character springs up um, and I will advertise some of those vacancies in-house and see if there's a previous character who I've written that may or may not fit there and if they do what they bring to the interview whether there'd be a good match, whether the chronology works. Uh, can't do it for everyone, otherwise I end up, otherwise the whole thing would be um, Anthony Powell's Dance to the Music of Time. But, uh, um, but, but, uh, but yes, uh, I, uh, it's, it's, it's both, um, it's both pre-scripted and improvised as I go along too. Yeah. Thanks for your question. 
Uh, this is from Tim. Um, on the topic of royalties, what impact do you think streaming services would have had on Utopia Avenue's career? Um, well, um, they probably wouldn't have been the same band, would they? Um, it might depend if they were forming in 67 as they do in the book or if they formed in 2017. Yes. Uh, and the question could go either way. Um, uh, um, I might ask you to field this one, if you would. Well, I st all I can say is I still, in fact, there was, there was a, a Tim, Tim actually, it could be the same, is that Tim as well? Yes, it is, a, is that a Tim? Hang on a second. Anyway, Tim wrote earlier, you mentioned Spotify earlier. Streaming is a massive shift for the music industry. Musicians have to tour to make money. How do you choose to purchase your music? Well, I, I buy CDs and I go on to Bandcamp. That's it. Uh, to purchase it, yeah. Bandcamp. It's, 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 it's a little like um, uh, certain online giant retailers who uh, I may look up to uh, get certain details of the book, but, um, but I figure that they're doing so well anyway that uh, uh, I phone up my independent bookstore and read the ISBNs down the line. Yes, um, yes. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, cool. uh, music is absolutely crucial. And uh, musicians have to be paid. I hate this idea mm. that music should be for free. It drives me nuts. Um, it's something that, I can't avoid the phrase kids these days. We're now old enough to use that without embarrassment, perhaps. But um, kids these days probably can't remember a time when it wasn't as cheap as a public utility. It's essentially as expensive as drinking water. It might be cheaper than drinking water. Um, and, and, and the thing, well, I always say to people, how would you like not to be paid for the work you do? Simple. Um, right. From Kirk, could we find out how David chose the name in the band? Duh. I grew up in Queens, New York City, and near a street called Utopia Parkway, which yeah. was also used as the title of a Fountains of Wayne album. Was that an influence? Um, uh, Chris Collinsworth, I think, from uh, Fountains of Wayne, he actually got in touch, um, and, and, and it was just one of these. Uh, it's, it's another example of how music uh, brings people together. Uh, I didn't know uh, the album before uh, I wrote the book. Uh, it came out in the 90s and I was in Japan, this is pre-internet, so there's big, big holes in my, uh, in areas of my cultural knowledge. Um, I agonised over the name for many, 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 many you months. You said you, you were going to, you might call it the way out at one point. Yeah, uh, that was true. Uh, the it was, it was uh, I knew quite early on that the title of the book was going to be the same as the band. Um, had to be good then. Uh, the way out, uh, the way out was leading the pack for a long time. Uh, my publishers were a little indifferent to it, uh, but it was actually my mum. Uh, she said it sounded like a support group for people thinking about suicide, uh, <laughs> and, and and a bit dark, mum. But uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I may be 52, but I'm not old enough to, uh, 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 to 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 stop listening to my mother when it counts. So um so yeah um I think she was right. Um plus it's a uh, negation and a good title. Generally they're positives, uh, and I like the oxymoron of utopia, which means nowhere. And yeah. Avenue is uh, a suburb built in the late 50s, 60s. They're full of avenues, usually named by trees. Um, in fact, that's your line, um, or Bernard Sumner's line. Um, he talked about estates in Salford where the streets are named after trees, but there aren't any trees. In fact, he didn't see his first tree till he was nine years old. <laughs> uh, so... Um, but also, so it's, big avenues, it's also there's big avenues in Queens as well. Yeah, the yeah. Boulevards in, in yeah, yeah. In both cases, they are firmly places. So an oxymoronic title is kind of cool. And um, slightly banal places as well. So and the, um, the whole idea of utopia is so fantastic in a way. It seemed like a, um, a cocktail with a fantastic element and a humdrum element. And yeah. I like that combo. Right, we're going to whistle through the remaining questions. Uh, there's a couple more um, from Bryant. 
Is there any chance that any of your characters may sneak into other works that are not strictly yours alone? For instance, the new Matrix movie. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, that, of course, uh, in, uh, in, in, in uh, mashup parlance is a crossover. Uh, the Matrix isn't my world. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's the world of the Wachowski siblings. And I was really honoured and hugely enjoyed the experience of collaborating uh, uh, on Matrix 4. But uh, it's not my world to import my toys into. Uh, uh, I was able to contribute uh, new uh, characters. Uh, it, 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 it was an intensely collaborative thing, so they aren't all mine. But uh, but they, but all of them, but all of the new characters did originate uh, as as a third of an idea from Lana uh, Wachowski or Alexander Heyman or myself. But uh, of course, the others, uh, the other two, would then a bit like a song, perhaps uh, work on them. Um, to to improve them and to animate them and make them fit. So lovely idea, but uh, but no. Plus, you don't cross entertainment lawyers. Uh, they're pretty scary. No, and, uh... no you don't. <laughs> um, two more. One sure. is from Tricia. This is I like this one. It's a curveball. Just to go off sideways, David. As I'm saving your book for holes, you write of exquisite prose and weaver of worlds. Who would you? <laughs> Who would you like to most like to sleep with out of all your novels? <laughs> oh my word! My word! You don't my have word. You don't have uh, to uh, Well, my wife's just downstairs, so 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 so, so I, I better be really, really <laughs> diplomatic here. Um, um, well, as maybe said somewhere in uh, uh, at the end of the Netflix show. Sensate, uh, 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 there's a character perhaps somewhere who says, never say no to a good orgy. <laughs> so, so kind of, um, uh, uh, why limit oneself to one? Uh, it's there, one no. answer. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it was a curveball question and that's my curveball answer. Body swerve. Uh, um, so uh, then, uh, finally, um, Oh no, you've got, uh, there's another couple, so I'll, I'll do them quickly. From Iman again, I love the cover of Utopia Avenue. How did you come up with it? Oh, I didn't, uh, a really clever designer. Uh, it's just, a, it's, um, it should be my, next to me. Uh, if, you'll, if you'll just give me a moment to go and get the book and be right back, don't go anywhere. Um, while I'm here, I'm just going to say the message from Katie. Thank you both for a lovely evening and for both writing books that matter to me, look out, look forward to many more. Thanks, Katie. And um, here we go. David's uh, come back with a book cover, yeah. There we go. Um, a very gifted designer came up with it. Uh, and he, he floated uh, some alternative, um, I'm sure there's a proper word for them in design circles, but uh, four rough ideas for kind of, uh, for different types of design. One was a type of graphic, uh, one was more realist, uh, one was something like this, yes. I can't remember the fourth. Uh, we chose something like this, uh, and then he sent a, um, another four back. Actually, there were pieces of pre-existing designs, um, yes. uh, things from exhibitions or, uh, shows or, or or film posters or something. So we narrowed it down. Uh, I liked the Sergeant um, the Sergeant Pepper's animation. Uh, there's, there's, there's 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 something of that here. Um, it also reminds me slightly of the um, of the Thirteenth uh, Floor Elevator psychedelic sounds on cover. Yes, similar similar colours anyway in the colour and the kind of swirly shape. Uh, that that slight is important. Uh, I did want it to. Uh, to hark back to 60s design, but yeah. I didn't want it to be a pastiche, uh, a slavish right. copy of 60s design. So something you can't quite put your finger on that's 2020 about it as well. So, uh, and, and, and uh, I think the designer did a great job. I'm also going to show you the end papers because they're pretty cool. Cool. Um, so, uh, very nicely, it's a very nicely um, printed and, and, and packaged book. Right, we've got two more. I'm going to have to hurry everybody up now. From Daniel, how many offers have you received to unbury the book? 
you buried a while ago. Uh, this refers to the future, uh, the future um, library project, uh, which is a project conceived by Scottish uh, artist Katie Patterson, uh, which involves a thousand saplings being planted in a forest outside Oslo, and between now and the year 2114, uh, um, an act of persuasion will uh, will extract a manuscript one from one writer per year uh, for all these years. Uh, of course, the later uh, many of these writers haven't been born yet. Um, some of their parents haven't been born yet, uh, and then in the year 2114, the trees will be chopped down and they'll be turned into paper and a hundred years worth of manuscripts that have never been seen will be printed. Oh, manuscripts. Lovely. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a vote of confidence in the future uh, that a yeah. hundred years from now, there'll still be a Norway and forests and reading and books and libraries. Well, I, think, I think it's very, I mean, you know, again, that's what I liked about the book is that it harks back. And I think that's what, what's needed now is confidence in the future and hope for the future, because at the minute, there's so many forces you know, in the media and in politics which are playing upon people's fears for the future. So to go back to a time when there seemed to be hopeful future and people were envisioning this, which they are in Utopia Avenue, is very, very important. And, and so for me, as, as a backdrop to, to this story, it was very important. And it was a nice place to be during that time. It's one of the reasons I wrote 66. I wanted to be in 1966 because it was a groovy time mm. so um i think that's very very important about the book i've got one more i've got one more question oh sorry did you want to say something David? just wanted to say maybe that's what utopia is for uh it isn't a destination it's a it's a glimpse of 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 of, of a fairer more equitable world now you may never get there but if you don't have glimpses of it, you have no compass, you have no um, coordinates. Uh, there is no sun for you to set your controls to the heart of. No, quite. No, I think that's a very, very good place to stop. Um, thank you everybody who's participated. Sorry, Gillian, I th I'm afraid we've run out of time with your cosmic question. Um, um, but I think we ought to stop now. Um, and I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank Will and Edward from Waterstones for helping to set this up and for it to work. And I'd like to thank David for joining me. And I really enjoyed reading the book and having this conversation. And I wish it could last longer. Thank you all. Thank you very much indeed, John. At this point, I would, if we were on stage, I would look at you and mime clapping. So perhaps uh, people who are watching this and they're either is our way could give John. We can uh, vote. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Really. And thank bye. you too, John. Bye bye, bye. now. Bye.